The reason animal agriculture creates so many sustainability problems is quite simple. It's terribly inefficient, <laughs> and it wastes resources, it wastes energy, and it wastes lives. You can produce 15 times more protein from plants as you can from any animal on any given area of land. Meat and dairy products require up to 100 times more water than plant-based foods, a fraction of the fossil fuel use. And remember, plants sequester greenhouse gases. They take greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere and sequester them into the soil rather than causing them. Let's look at an example out of many, many, uh, of how inefficiently we're using our agricultural land in the United States. Let's just look at this a minute. We're using 94 million acres for corn. 46% of that corn is fed directly to livestock, but that number is a little bit uh, deceiving in a way because 43% of all corn grown is used for ethanol for fuel. So let's back that out. Actually, 82% of all the corn raised in our country that's not used for fuel is fed to livestock. Another 83 million acres are used for soybeans, of which 91% in the United States is fed to livestock. 56 million acres are planted in hay, of which 100% is fed to livestock. And if that weren't enough, another 864 million acres are used for grazing livestock, total, on both public and private lands in the United States. That's ridiculous. Now, just for comparison's sake, I picked out one of many, many examples of some other way to use this land. Just, let's just think about this for a minute. How can we use this land a little differently? Maybe we could grow vegetables, fruit, or nuts, or some ancient grain, such as amaranth, quinoa, kamut. So I, I just happened to pick out buckwheat. Just close my eyes and pick one out, and I picked buckwheat out as an example. Now, we're currently growing buckwheat on 34,000 acres in the United States. Well, what's that supposed to mean? Buckwheat's considered somewhat of an ancient grain, but it's actually a fruit seed, not a grain. And from a human health standpoint, buckwheat offers you complete protein, containing all eight essential amino acids and a very, a very high utilization rate, meaning your body uses about 74 to 75% of the protein in buckwheat. Buckwheat's low in fat, gluten-free, packed with powerful fiber, helps with insulin regulation, so it reduces the risk of diabetes and obesity and hypertension. It has a number of antioxidants, many of them waiting to be discovered many anti-cancer agents, and buckwheat also has the highest level of a substance called rutin of any food. Rutin is a very powerful anti-inflammatory agent. As a crop, growing buckwheat requires minimal water, grows in almost any type of soil, it suppresses weeds as you're growing it, and it adds nutrients to the soil. It sometimes used as a cover crop. We use it in our farm. Uh, out of all the land in the United States, used to produce food. Out of all the land combined to produce food, only this much, what you see on the screen here, is devoted to growing uh, buckwheat. Oh, oh my goodness. You, that's tiny. Uh, you probably can't see that. Let me blow that up a little bit for you. Oh, there you go. Uh, 0.003%. That's, that's three thousandths of a percent of all the land used to grow food in the United States is used for buckwheat. And most of that's handed over to livestock. Given, <laughs> given all the amazing human health benefits of buckwheat and all the soil rebuilding characteristics of this wonderful plant, what percent do you think this should be? Quite a bit more. And remember, this is just one of many examples of how we could use our soil and water more efficiently to produce healthier foods for us to eat directly. Getting back very quickly, just a quick example of the human health benefits, many studies have been accomplished and are, are now underway as well that are documenting the enormous amount of benefits that phytonutrients have and found only in plants, can't be found in animal products, and all the disease prevention and treatment characteristics of these compounds. You'll hear much more about this, I'm sure, from many other speakers here. Here are just a few of the many studies related to rutin to tie this back into buckwheat, which is only one of the many phytonutrients found in buckwheat. And I wonder how many studies like this we could find that document all the health benefits of eating meat. <laughs> not, ver not very many. And this is just one compound found in just one plant. There are many, many other examples that we know of and are yet to be discovered. This statistic needed to be updated. Livestock now produce 7 million pounds of urine and feces every 60 seconds in our country. 7 million pounds which is 
a hundred times more than what the entire human population produces, and none of this is treated. To be sure, world hunger has many layers of complexity. One of the larger reasons is tied to poverty, but another significant factor is the looming shadow of our current demand to eat livestock and fish, which is indirectly tied to poverty. In fact, eating these animals ultimately affects food prices, food availability, and policymaking, which then suppresses progress in developing countries. We're having difficulty with this right now, with a couple of projects that we're working on in Mozambique and elsewhere. Last year, there was considered a record harvest grain in the world, with over three billion tons produced. But nearly half of that was given to animals in the meat and dairy industries. Importantly to know, each year, 77% of all coarse grain produced in the world for food, 77% is consumed by livestock. We can't blame climate change, droughts, or flooding for the world's food security issues. Clearly, the, the difficulty is not, is not how or if we can produce enough food to feed the hungry or the growing global population, but rather where all the food we produce globally is going. Well, not too long ago, I was um, asked to speak to microfinance leaders uh, of many countries at their international annual conference in Istanbul. Among many other things, I explained that the correlation between animal-based food production systems, the correlation between that and world hunger, which is what they're trying to solve, can be found in generalized global factors as well as on a local basis within the countries where hunger and poverty rates are high. Global factors include manipulation and control of seed manufacturing and pricing, primarily for livestock, seed and livestock feed crops by large companies such as Monsanto and DuPont, Global factors also include buying and selling of grain, including futures by ADM and Cargill. And global factors include uh, many factors through slaughterhouses and packaging by Cargill, Swift, Tyson, and JBS. These few but very large and powerful companies control over 65% of all the seed and grain, and they control over 80% of all the final animal products found in the world. It's a very monopolized production and economic system, manufacturing seeds at one end and spewing out meat at the other. Because of the global demand for meat, cultural, social, political, and economic influences remain strongly supportive of the continued dominance of these large companies and of the meat and dairy and fishing industries in general. This then drives how global resources are used, how money is spent, and how policies are determined. The demand for animal products, whether factory, whether factory farmed or not, in developed countries, then drives resource depletion in developing countries, as well as perpetuating hunger and, po hunger and poverty. That is the connection. If, so we need to stop this, and we can stop it by supporting, with our dollars, only organically grown plant-based foods and those smallholder farmers who produce them. Solving world hunger, though, isn't as simple as giving them the grain that would normally go to livestock. That's always been an argument. Just, just give them some grain that, that we normally would give to livestock. Well, it's not that easy. The solution, particularly in developing countries that I've written about and advocated for over the years, requires a multi-dimensional approach to sustainability, established on many levels simultaneously, with organic plant-based food systems at the nucleus. The model for success at reducing hunger in developing countries, I believe, should look like this. No livestock. This is the model where all world hunger funding should be spent if it's to be considered responsible financing. One group that's making this happen that we should all support is the Purpose Group International. They're doing wonderful things and we need to get behind them. The Purpose Group International.